Hey gang, we are in Homosassa, Florida. We're about mm, about an hour north of Tampa Bay, and we're at a cemetery here called Fountains Memorial Park. And we're here today actually to see the grave of nine-year-old girl. A very, very sad story. I'm going to warn you. This one is not only heart-wrenching, but uh, there's there's a couple of parts that are really brutal. So you may want to pass on this one. It's a very famous case. You may have heard of it. It's very famous in Florida and around the country about Jessica Lunsford. I want to thank Krista Trevet for suggesting the story and others subsequently who suggested I do the story. I was kind of I wanted to do the story because Jessica needs to be continued to be remembered. It ha happened a while back. I'm sure she's remembered, but we got to keep the fire alive. So let's take the walk and I'll tell you the story. It's a very small cemetery, but it has some interesting facets to it. The first being these, and I'm going to pan around here. We've got these vaults. I've never seen any vaults like this before. Looks like they're made of flagstone. There's a close-up here of one here. And they're, I would call them vaults. And there are a lot of them here. This one here appears to have some, maybe some gargoyles on it. <laughs> But let's, let's talk about this story. Like I said, Jessica Lunsford was nine years old when a terrible crime happened that we're going to talk about. She was born on October 6, 1995, up in North Carolina. And her mother had gone through several miscarriages. And I mention that because I guess it makes the birth of Jessica so so special it was so special for the parents the grandparents finally were able to have a child and everybody was so elated and of course as Jessica grew up they were all doting on her she was the uh, she was it her father had a particularly close relationship with her Jessica uh, sadly, the parents, soon after her birth, had divorced, and Mark, her father, had custody, and he would be the one to raise her. And he would take her to work, and he had a construction job, and they would just basically do everything together. Now, when she was around five or six years old, Mark's parents had moved down here to Florida, and Dad said, well, what do you think? I mean, they were all very close. And how, how about, why don't we just go? Let's, let's go with Grandpa and Grandma. And, of course, Jessica said, I'm game. Let's go. And they moved down here, right here where we're at. And they moved into a trailer park. Actually, they were living in the trailer where his folks lived. And they were all living together happily. And she was daddy's little girl. Sadly, on February 24th, 2005, it would all come crashing down. It was that night, and Jessica had just disappeared. Now, she had seen her father that evening. They were... They were, of course, together. I think they had dinner, and Dad had a date. Dad was going to be home really late, and Dad was staying over at the date's place. I don't know if it was planned or not, but sadly, the door was left unlocked. I don't know if it was Dad's fault or what, but the door was left unlocked, and Dad didn't come home till the next morning, I believe. Well... Jessica was gone. The, uh, her alarm was going off and going off and checked the room and no Jessica. What had happened? Who knows? Of course, 
Dad was not going to fool around. He called the police right away. And Grandpa and Grandma, everybody was, they got the friends together. They were searching and searching. And as what happens many times is the father becomes a suspect and also the grandfather and the police really, they really were hard on these guys. And you know, you have to wonder, you know, it's a tactic and many, you know, sometimes it's, it's the case. But they, they had these guys, I think, for three days in interrogation. And they were just really rough on them. And I mean physically, too. It was, it was a terrible situation. But they, they really got through the interrogation. It's kind of like, come on, guys, let's focus on, let's focus on finding her. You've got to not be tunnel visioned. So what they did was they said, they finally got out of their tunnel vision and they said, well, who are the sexual offenders that live around here? Who are the bad guys, right? Think about it, she's nine years old. And they started putting some pieces together. Now there were over 200 sexual offenders that had to be they had to go through the list, but there was one guy who seemed to kind of stand out. And when they figured out that he was staying at his sister's trailer, living there, his sister's trailer was less than 100 yards away from, from the Lunsfords. So big red flag comes out. It was a 46-year-old man. His name was John Cooey. And he also had an extensive arrest record for burglary and other crimes. And as I said, sexual offender. And they went to the trailer, they, you know, they, they rushed over there, but he was gone. Of course, he was gone. Now that's another big flag. So just over a couple of weeks later on March 12th, this John Cooey was arrested in Augusta, Georgia. He was staying at a halfway house there. They kind of put the pieces together, be on the lookout. And you have to give kudos, and if I can find the name, I'll put it in the caption, or I'll put it in here. The woman who was running the Salvation, I think it was Salvation Army, you know, the word was out. His picture, her picture, everyone was looking. And she was alert, and he checked in, and she checked him in, she remained calm. And she called the police, so they picked him up right away. And they brought him in. Now, they couldn't really, you know, they couldn't hold him on, you know, you know they were, he was not, he was denying everything. He, you know, I didn't do it, what are you talking about? So... They were really, they had them on the, you know, when you leave the state, you leave where you're a registered sex offender, they kind of had them on that. So they were trying to break them down and break them down and break them down. And it was just a couple days later on March 14th that his, well, it was his half-sister, this woman that owned this trailer, Dorothy Dixon, she apparently gave permission for police to go through the trailer. I don't know if it was a search warrant or what, maybe you can put in comments. But this woman was living there with a whole group of, you know, there was a whole bunch of people living in there. Of course, John was living there with her, but it, she was with her boyfriend, a guy named Matt Dietrich and her daughter and son-in-law, and her two-year-old grandson. So it was, it was terrible because this place was a, a den, a, a cocaine den. They were just drug users and criminals. You know, they would steal money to get their drugs. Just a scumbag hole. During the search, they opened the closet and they found a mattress and pillows. And it was John's closet, it was the room that he was staying in. And guess what they found on the mattress? There was a big stain, turned out to be a blood stain. 
and forensic analysis would put Cooey's DNA on there and also Jessica's DNA. Kind of knew they had their man. March 17th, he was arrested, charged with the murder and extradited back down to Florida, Citrus County Jail. A lot of veterans here, guys. Is this a beautiful statue? Look at that. And I'll tell you this, you gotta give kudos to this cemetery here. And I know they're here because there are cars. They are active, but I don't see one flag down. Look at this. Don't you love it? You know, I always try to look for flags if, if we see any, and I don't see one down. It just gives you a lot of pride. Gives you a real warm feeling to know that our veterans are remembered and honored. Well, he made a confession, he did, this creep, this monster. Full confession, they broke him down finally. He was like a baby. He got a videotaped confession from him, kidnapping and all that happened that I'm going to tell you. And again, this is your last chance to, to turn it off. But what happened was he came, you know, actually he was out with his, uh, the sister of the gang and they were doing drugs. They were at some scrap pile place, some gravel pit and they ran out of money, they ran out of drugs, they ran out of liquor, so it's like, let's call it a night. Well, John went home, laid in bed, and he couldn't call it a night. He didn't want to call it a night. And he wanted to go burgle, seal something to sell for drug money, or so he went over to the Lunsford's trailer and the door was open and he went in. And when he went in, or when he was in there, Jessica woke up and she confronted him. And she didn't scream or anything, she was very compliant, if you will, because he basically started telling her, he put his hand over her mouth and just said, hey, be quiet, and he was giving her orders, and she was following the orders. Very sadly, and he got her, he was just manipulating her and tricking her, and he told her that you need to come with me. So they silently crept out of that trailer. They went to his trailer, his sister's trailer, climbed in the window of his little bedroom, and he coaxed her in there. And once she was in there, she was in the trap. Sadly, she was caught in the trap. Well, this is the bad part, but I think it was three days over the next three days. How, how these idiots, <laughs> got to keep my composure here, how this sister and these other idiots in the trailer didn't know what was going on for three days. He raped her, this nine-year-old girl, and salted her and kept put, and then he would put her in the closet. He's like, you just stay in here. And he turned the TV up, he goes, I got to go to work. Of course, he never had a job. I don't know, who knows what he was doing. He was probably burglarizing places. And she stayed in there. She was afraid. And he did it over and over and over again, over three days. He didn't feed her. Of course, the autopsy would show that later. She had no food in her system. He just kept her in the closet with that TV on. Just imagine. Well, after three days, of course, he didn't know what to do with her, and he decided that he was going to kill her. And this coward, you know, there's no good way, but I mean, this guy, like, is such a coward that he couldn't, like, face her. So what he tricked her to get into garbage bags, or a big garbage bag, I think it was some kind of bin bag, and she complied, and she, the last thing she did was she, she had her, when he had kidnapped her, she asked if she could bring her, uh, she loved, we'll talk about this at her grave, 
One of the things she loved was her stuffed animals, and her dad had won her a stuffed animal of a dolphin, and it was her favorite. It was the week before at the fair, and she wanted to take it with. So she was holding on that, and she climbed in. And I think he said to her, I said, well, I'm just gonna like leave you on the lawn, you know, and then you can just get out of the bag and go home. Well, what he did was he dug a hole in the mud and he put her inside, of course, the bag down in the, the hole and he buried her alive. That's right. That's what this coward piece of scum did. This beautiful, this beautiful girl. And she died there. And it gets worse because when they, you know, he, I'm not going to get into the whole trial, but, you know, on trial, he finally, you know, after the confession, told where the body was, got the body, and they were horrified to see that she had poked her fingers, two of her fingers, through the, the bag as she was being buried, probably trying to escape or get air. And her, her fingers were still sticking out. All the decomposition, basically just bones, were inside it was decomposed. You know, she was kind of preserved in the bag, but very decomposed. That's how they found little Jessica. Well, we are here to find Jessica where she is today. And it is, it is right over here. So as we approach the grave, I'm going to actually come from the backside because dad's names are on there on these other stones with their birth dates. And I don't like to show that on my channel, people's birth dates that are still alive for, you know, respect and privacy purposes. But this is, this is the stone. And I'm going to, let's see, I'm going to come back, I'm going to come back here to the front in such a way that we don't show the birth dates. Let's see, let me do it. Let me just do this here and we'll come and see her stone this way. So there it is. Beautiful stone for Jessica Marie Lunsford. October 6, 1995, February 24th, 2005. And I'll give you a a little shot here you can see all kinds of toys pumpkins some beautiful flowers a little statue a little pink flamingo it looks like right so I've got some roses we're gonna put down here for her I hope that her parents I hope her father, Mark's doing okay, in good health. We have Ruth and Archie here to the right. Archie has passed away, I believe, when he died last year, or two years ago, October 13th, 2020. Well, he was convicted, found guilty on all charges, March 7th, 2007, and the case was appealed to the Florida Supreme Court. Why, I don't know. How, you know, I guess that's our rights, right? But on August 24th, 2007, and I see that's like, what, well, two and a half years later, he was sentenced to death. In addition to three consecutive life sentences. But he had been in bad health. He was a sick character to begin with, and unfortunately, for justice for all, on September 30th, 2009, he escaped the executioner because that's when he died in prison of natural causes. Well, let me tell you, he did not escape. He is, he has faced, he, he is in the hot place right now. He's in the hot seat. You can only imagine what happened to him and what's going on with him. You know what, he probably would have sat in prison for the next 30 or 40 years, so it's just as well. But Jessica does have a big legacy here, Florida, around the country, and a lot. her father had a lot to do with it. 
who pursued new legislation to provide more stringent tracking of these sex offenders who are roaming around and roam around today, and that is the Jessica Lunsford Act. It was named after her. Requires tighter restrictions on sex offenders, you know, wearing the tracking devices, increased prison sentences, all kinds of good stuff. Well, Jessica was described as being a bit shy when she was in school, but when she was around the right people, like people she knew, she was a lot of fun, very caring and giving. Jessica loved to sing and dance. Her favorite color was purple. And as I alluded to before, she loved her stuffed animals. In fact, she had a huge collection of stuffed animals. I'm going to close this out by trying to describe to you that her father, uh, Mark and her, had this thing and some of us have with our children where I love you, I love you more. No, I love you more. And we have that in our family. And they would describe it, Mark would say, I love, you know, I'm gonna use one hand, but imagine another hand like you're showing how big a fish is. I love you this much. And she'd go, I love you this much. And then he would take the back of his palm, um, back of his hands and put them like facing each other. And he said like full circle. It's like infinity, love you infinity. And she went like this, she went, I love you this much. He's like, what? She goes, no one can get closer than you and me. So that's how much love they had. And God bless Mark, I hope you're doing okay, buddy. So with that, I'm just gonna close it out here this beautiful young lady will never be forgotten. Rest in peace and to good health to the Lunsfords that remain.